Kayla, you want to take her through their warm ups? Robinson, are you ever going to have horns to the group? Uh, actually, that is coming, and that's a good question, Mr. Weeks. Once we develop our jazz band program, we will be adding horns so that we can go to stacks and we can do all the best holiday recordings. One step at a time, we've been together for six months. allowed us to spend some time working with vocals on improving their uh, harmony vocals. And I ran into, and it's not a, a new tune, one of the things I love to do is try to teach them. They know the music they like today. I don't know about you, but I hate their music. <laughs> they know that. Uh, what they don't know is a lot of where that music came from, and that's what I feel my job is. I want to teach them the old stuff. The reason being is they can all go into their own garages and jam out on all the stuff they love every day. They don't need me to do that. So the best thing I can do is bring them historically along to realize why their music sounds the way it does and what influenced the music they listen to. How many of you kids play in your own group, some of them maybe within you guys, I don't keep track of what you guys do, play within your own groups of other other groups, other guys. And do you primarily do music of today or some of the older stuff? I don't know what I'm talking about. I've only been doing this for six months. So anyway, out of that came the song The Cause by the Beatles. And I don't know if any of you know about history, but I, I love history and I love rock and roll history. And the reason this song, we are performing this song almost exactly as they tried to do it in the studio, minus the technology. It was done by George, John, and uh, Paul, and they overdubbed their three voices three times for a total of nine voices on the track. I'm one vocalist short on the ninth voicing. Uh, and at the same time, historically for me, I'm a huge Beatles fan, by the way. This is actually, maybe everybody doesn't know this. I don't know if you know the history of the Beatles or not. You know that Abbey Road was the last album they recorded but not the last album they released. They flipped it and went with Let It Be because they were waiting for the movie to be done. So on Abbey Road, which was the final thing that they, they made, the actual last recording they made in the studio was this song. And so this is, in my mind, the last Beatles song. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need a hug. <laughs>
it there. Does everybody know the chord progression for that song? It is Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata backwards. That's how John figured it out. He was uh, in his uh, apartment with Yoko. She was playing the Moonlight Sonata. He heard it and asked her to play the progression. It's not the melody, it's the progression backwards, and that's what got him to start writing the cause. Just a little bit of trivia there. Um, from there, repertoire is everything. Um, you know, we have to deal with lyric content and all those things. And I happen to have an English teacher, a friend of mine, who's also our, our marching percussion instructor, which really kind of is weird. But anyway, <laughs> what's nice is that I can come to him, and when we have a lyric problem, um, for the most part, he can find me a wonderful way around it because we never want to offend anyone. Um, we do a song um, by Sum 41 called Fat Lip. And a Fat Lip unfortunately has a, a reference to abortion in, in the lyrics. And I just didn't feel comfortable uh, going out in public dealing with that issue. So believe it or not, because I don't know about you, most people aren't really listening to the lyrics all the time with what we're doing. We simply, because I was more interested in rhyming, chose extortion over abortion and it worked fine and we've never had any complaints. Um, a lot of times uh, I don't change the keys that we were originally in. These are the keys that we record in. I have limited male voices. I'm not going to hide anything. I tell them when they're good and I tell them when they're bad. We're a little bit weak on the male voice in. We don't have that screaming high tenor of uh, Jimmy Page, that, I mean uh, Robert Plant that I wish I had. Um, and I don't have that wonderful Michael Jackson soulful sound up top. So we are notorious for taking our lovely ladies and bringing them in and allowing them to sing the high parts. So it was especially noticeable in Hard Day's Night. When we hit the bridge, all of a sudden we had Mackenzie sing the bridge. And it doesn't bother me. I'll interchange the voices. And a lot of times then what we have to do is the whole he, she, you know, thing. So we babe works wonderful. There's always words you can find to kind of make it, you know, so that you're not having to worry about uh, the, the uh, Orient, uh, sexual orientation of your lead vocalist and what they're singing. So, at the same time, I got to tell you a little bit about our community. It's a little bit uh, rural, and <laughs> the Beatles is not the number one thing in their in their mind. It's country, and I'm not a big country fan, but I will admit they brought this to me. Wasn't it Bobby who brought this to me? Brought this to me and said, <laughs> and, uh, that, "That's what they say." But this is unfortunate. Or this is. Unfortunately, or however you want it, this is actually our best song. <laughs> they naturally just do it in our in our community. Uh, this is a sound called Hick Town, and when we play, yeah. we play at our basketball games sometimes, and we play tailgate parties for our football games. All oh, the crowd goes nuts when we play Hick Town. And Mr. Brown, my superintendent, he's a big country fan. I have to play this for him. This is for you, Mr. Brown. <laughs> oh, Carl. 